The year is 1793. Louis XVI has just been executed. France is devastated by its civil war and is now threatened by the First Coalition. Paranoia and terror, oh terror, grips the country by its throat as the people demand more and more purges. As a result, almost 17,000 are executed in just over a year. France now lives under the tyranny of the Committee of Public Safety, with at its head, Maximilien Robespierre. It was June 8th, 1794. In the Ancien Régime, the people of France would have celebrated Pan Coast. Now, they celebrate the cult of the Supreme Being. A religion which honored virtue, an ideal often discussed by Rousseau. Robespierre had introduced this new religion just a month prior on his 36th birthday, and the following day, the National Convention had made it the civic religion of France. And so, on this holy day, a procession left the Tuileries Palace and was now headed towards the Champ de Mars. It was led by the members of the National Convention, but also pregnant women and breastfeeding mothers with their infants. At his head, there was Robespierre, wearing an elaborate sky-blue suit, feathers in his hat, and elevated shoes to offset his small stature. Soon, he was far ahead of the procession as he walked quickly with an agitated air, as he usually did. The other members of the National Convention trailed behind, either out of defiance or apathy. Many openly mocked the ridicule of the event, but Robespierre didn't seem to care, as for him, his festival was a resounding success. Having arrived at the Champ de Mars, the convention now climbed atop an artificial mountain where a liberty tree was planted. There, Robespierre delivered two speeches in which he emphasized the importance of a supreme being. Before walking down the mountain under the applause of the crowd, he was beaming with joy and he had every reason to be. Having been elected president of the National Convention just four days prior, Robespierre was at the height of his power. But this celebration, this joy, hid an underlying layer of tension, of exacerbation, of anger, as the stiffness and discomfort of the event reflected the state of the revolution. And the prominent role of Robespierre and his recurrent allusions to Christianity, with his descent from the mountain resembling Moses and the Ten Commandments, led to a growing discontentment among the members of the National Convention. Some openly question whether the supreme being wasn't Robespierre himself, with one decrying, Look at the bugger! It's not enough for him to be master! He had to be God! On June 10th, the National Convention passed the law of the Vendeux Prairial, a law co-offered by Robespierre and Georges Couton. Feeling that France's prisons were overcrowded and imagining enemies of the revolution at every corner, the law hoped to solve these problems by drastically reducing the rights of the accused. As Couton stated, The guilty have no right to a counsel and the innocent do not need any. As such, the accused were no longer entitled to a public trial, were no longer entitled to counsel or lawyer, and were no longer entitled to review of the witnesses who were often made up. Anyone deemed an enemy of the people could be deemed guilty, but the definition of such an enemy was so broad that as little as inspiring discouragement could find you guilty. And now, all guilt meant death. Execution rates, which were already quite high following the law of suspects, soared to 80%. And as a result, in just two months, the revolutionary government had executed more than half as many people as it had executed the year prior. In its pursuit of virtue, France had now entered the Great Terror.
On June 26, 1794, the Revolutionary Army decisively defeated the Coalition Army during the Battle of Fleurus, thus allowing France to capture the entirety of the Austrian Netherlands. This victory also meant that Paris was no longer threatened by the royalist troops. And with this looming peril now gone, many members of the National Convention demanded an end to the reign of terror. But Robespierre strongly objected to it. However, the toll that the revolution was taking on him worsened and worsened his mental and physical health to the point that Robespierre was increasingly absent from the Jacobin Club and the National Convention. This absence allowed the growth of conspiracies as Fouché worked tirelessly day and night to organize Robespierre's downfall, saying to each and every deputy, you perish tomorrow if Robespierre does not. He quickly gained allies among the many deputies that Robespierre had disenfranchised, such as the members of the Committee of General Security, who felt marginalized by the law of the Vendeux Prairial, which had been introduced without their consultation, and the increasing amount of functions that the Committee of Public Safety had taken away from them. Robespierre knew all too well that opinions were shifting against him, as his speeches, while fewer and farther between, became increasingly accusatory and filled with laments. On July 1st, he denounced a conspiracy against him, saying, In London, I am denounced to the French army as a dictator. The same slanders have been repeated in Paris. Two days later, following a heated argument, he stormed out of the committee, slamming the door on his way out, shouting, Well then, I release you from my tyranny. I withdraw. Save the country without me, if you can. Repeatedly, he attacked members of the convention and made no secrets of his intention to punish them, thus further bolstering the ranks of the conspirators. It was now July 26, known as the 8th of Fermidor in the Republican calendar. The first appearance of Robespierre at the National Convention in 40 days. He wore the same sky blue suit that he had worn during the Festival of the Supreme Being and gave a two hour long speech where he defended himself against the accusations of dictatorship and tyranny, lamented the fact that he was blamed for everything and claimed that England and the Committee of General Security were plotting to bring him down. He finished with a call for more purges, demanding that we punish the traitors, purge the bureau of the Committee of General Security, purge the Committee of Public Safety itself. These vague accusations, targeting no one in particular, meant that everyone felt they could fall victim of these new purges. And that night, the conspirators met up again, adamant that they needed to end Robespierre before he ended them. It was now the 9th of Fermidor. Saint-Just had just started a long tirade before he was abruptly interrupted by a deputy who threatened to use his dagger if the National Convention didn't have the courage to arrest Robespierre. Soon, more and more accusations from the deputies were thrown at Robespierre and his allies, who, feeling increasingly uneasy, increasingly overwhelmed, rushed to the plane, appealing for them to defend him against the Montagnards, but they shouted him down remembering all too well the numerous peers he had sent to the guillotine. Robespierre was at a loss for words, alone. Unable to defend himself without stammering, a deputy shouted, The blood of Danton chokes him! To which Robespierre replied, Is it Danton you regret? Cowards! Why didn't you defend him? As he was dragged down the tribune by the members of the convention, he shouted that the revolution was lost before he was arrested along with his little brother, Augustin Robespierre, and his closest supporters, Couton and Saint-Just. Soon after, Henriot rallied the sans culotte and much like his insurrection against the Girondins, he was now on his way to the Tuileries Palace, along with 3,000 soldiers of the National Guard, to take over the convention. 
As soon as they arrived, Orio was arrested by the Committee of General Security. And having lost their leader and seeing that Barras and his troops were heading towards them, the National Guard decided to retreat to the Hôtel de Ville. But the capture of Robespierre and his supporters, including Henriot, didn't last long, as the prison guards released them. And they had now taken shelter in the Hôtel de Ville with the National Guard. There, a long standoff started, with either side unsure on what to do next. And, receiving no new orders and no supplies, while suffering under the intense summer heat, many soldiers of the National Guard simply returned home until eventually Robespierre and his supporters were left with only 51 men to defend them. As such, when the convention declared them outlaws and ordered Barras and 4,000 men to arrest them, Robespierre knew he was lost, and he attempted suicide by shooting himself in the mouth, but only succeeded in destroying his jaw. Although other accounts claim that it was a soldier that shot him while he was attempting to escape. His little brother, Augustin, also attempted an escape by jumping out of a window but only succeeded in shattering his pelvis. While Ario was found severely injured in the gutter with an eye out of its socket after he had been defenestrated. Guiton was found at the bottom of a staircase, seriously injured after he had fallen off his chair during the assault, while Saint-Just, unmoved, simply surrendered without a word. The following day, Robespierre and 21 of his supporters were sent to the guillotine. The same guillotine that had executed Louis XVI, Danton, Desmoulins, Hébert, and many more. It was the 10th of Fermidor, a day of rest and festivity. A vast mob had gathered around the scaffold, where they eagerly cursed the accused and cheered their execution. As Saint-Just was brought to the guillotine, he kept his head high, full of pride, and said nothing but one last adieu to Robespierre. While Couton screamed of pain as they forced him under the blade, his crippled body being too rigid to properly lay on the machine. Robespierre, at first, said nothing, still in shock from his shattered jaw, from the events that had just unraveled, from the realization he would soon die, and along with him, his virtuous republic. But as the executioner removed his bandage to clear his neck, he left out an agonizing scream, a scream only silenced by the blade of the guillotine, echoing in La Place de la Révolution, announcing the end of a reign. The victory of the Revolutionary Army against the Coalition Army at Fleurus marked a turning point in the war as France would maintain this momentum to victory. Against all odds, despite fighting the greatest powers of its time, despite going through a violent revolution and just as violent counter-revolution, despite being torn apart by the Vendée and Federalist revolts, despite dealing with hyperinflation and food shortages, the young French Republic not only survived, but succeeded in gaining significant territorial concessions annexing Savoy, Nice, and the Austrian Netherlands, while creating multiple sister republics in Italy and the Netherlands. Finally, in 1797, France decisively defeated the Austrians at the Battle of Rivoli, allowing France to capture Mantua and thus forcing Austria to sue for peace and putting an end to the First Coalition War. During this Italian campaign, a young artillery officer recently promoted to the rank of general, particularly distinguished himself by his tactical genius and prowess, a certain Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, this was Barris. I will see you soon. But until then, my friends, merde! <laughs>